Howdy y'all and welcome back to Country Fried Minis. I'm your host Cameron, the country boy in the big city, presenting to you once again from the Bullshit Corner 2.0. And today, instead of talking to y'all about a little piece of country fried wisdom, I'd like to walk y'all through a full tutorial of painting a model of one of my favorite characters. In fact, my favorite character from my favorite game, Watson. Now anyone who's known me any length of time in my day-to-day, everyday, real life knows that I've put in an inordinate amount of time in Apex Legends. I think I'm sitting at somewhere around 1300 hours right now and I'm showing no signs of slowing down. It's my absolute favorite game and it mostly takes RNG out of the equation so this skill-based first-person shooter is a nice change of pace from these tabletop games. Whether I'm dropping in for some quick duos with my best homie back east, or getting in some intense trios with some friends out here in the Bay Area, the game is always sure to be a blast. I love it so much that I play probably every day for about 30 minutes to an hour, sometimes two or three hours. And through all that gaming, I've firmly established that my main character is Watson. You are the Apex Champions. I really love zoning people out, and that Interceptor sure is a hell of a game changer in those late game firefights. So, for that, I found a nice 3D model of this fabulous character and printed her out in infinity scale to use as some kind of stand-in proxy. Maybe as a rim racer, or the new CSU for season 14, but either way, I've sized her to the proper scale so I can get her on the tabletop. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get her painted up and show you step by step how you can paint one yourself. So as with any 3D printed model, I'm gonna start by checking out the quality of the print. I used the model included in the description and added my own custom supports and printed her out at a 0.02 millimeter layer height. I'm also going to use this here base I have left over from my US Army on the build by Antenasitis Workshop. The second base shown here in this clip is an extra one for me to glue the model on while I'm painting her. Once she's glued down to the base, I'm going to go ahead and bust out my airbrush and prep a little bit of this here white Stinyl Res primer. I'm going to add a few drops of water to it, maybe something like 10 or 15 percent concentration just to thin it out and make it spray a little more evenly through the airbrush. Since we're talking a model with super fine details, as is most often the case when printing out video game characters, it's a good idea to use lots of super fine layers of the primer so that you don't clot up the details. These models were optimized to be seen at a very large scale on a screen after all, and not printed out at such a tiny, tiny scale. So instead of ripping this here primer in one go as I would with any other wargaming model, I'm instead going to spray up many many super thin layers of this white color until all that green disappears. Furthermore, the choice to use a white primer is really going to help out putting those super bright colors down that make up Watson's default color scheme. Next up in the process, I'm going to use a little bit of this here Golden Fluid Acrylics brand Thalo Blue paint. Golden's colors aren't necessarily great for many painting, but they do have a whole hell of a lot of pigment inside them. So, if you thin them down to the right consistency, you get a really nice coverage with a very little bit of effort. And to facilitate thinning this stuff out, I'm going to use a little bit of this here Liquitex Acrylic Matte Medium to thin out the paint. This has the advantage of spreading the pigment out inside the material without breaking it down too much, as would happen if you use just pure water. But, 
for that matter, I'm going to add a couple dropperfuls worth of distilled water to this here paint to get it down to an extremely thin consistency. And once it's thinned down to a real runny consistency, something like skim milk, I'm going to go ahead and spray it all over the lower half of this model, kind of focusing from a bottom up direction to create a nice cool shadow over most of this model. This blue tone is going to do a lot of heavy lifting later on in the paint job and do all the shading on the white portions of this model. White's one of those colors that's super tricky to work with without getting too chalky, so I'm going to do a lot of the work now with this base coat color. And speaking of white getting chalky, I've made it a habit these days to use white ink instead of white paint, as the paints themselves tend to get real chalky. So for that, I'm going to use this here Liquitex white ink to go ahead and spray on a zenithal coat over top of that blue. For those of you who don't know by now what a zenithal coat is, what I'm going to do is spray this paint down from a top-down fashion, exactly the opposite of the blue shadow, and it's going to create highlights on the raised portions of the model just as if the sun was shining down on the model at its zenith. This will serve the twofold purpose of getting some quick and easy highlights on this model's undercoat, as well as showing us where to place our highlights later in the paint job. Now, with the airbrushed undercoating done, I'm going to jump on into the painting on this model. And to do that, I'm going to start with the most satisfying part of a paint job, applying a brand new sheet of parchment paper to my wet palette. I don't know why, but this is always so good. To get us started off doing the brushwork for this model, I'm going to go ahead and choose the first color, and that's going to be Citadel's Cantor Blue. I've chosen this base style paint so that I can apply the initial color with as few coats as possible. This color is first because I'll be applying it in the deepest recesses of the model, such as inside Watson's jacket. The heavy pigmentation should make quick work of this base coat. Next up, we're going to mix a little bit of this here, Citadel Calador Sky, onto the wet palette. This color will be added a bit at a time to the original Cantor Blue and applied to the model layer by layer. This layering process is the tried and true original method for painting miniatures, and although modern techniques exist to save time and effort, this classic layering technique can still produce fantastic results. The process here is to add a bit, then thin the paint with a little bit of water, and then apply this color to the previous layer, while making sure to leave a touch of the previous tone showing. It's important to work in thin layers here, as we're going to be using multiple coats to achieve detailed shading on the model. If the paint is too thick, it'll quickly start clotting up the finer details of the miniature. Though this portion can definitely benefit from artistic interpretation, it's quite simple to know where to place the highlights. Thinking back to the zenithal undercoat, the game plan here is to highlight up the upper facing portions of the model, just as was demonstrated by the spray of white from above. After multiple additions of the new color, eventually we'll be using straight Calador Sky, and we'll need to add a lighter tone to continue highlighting. To move on into brighter colors, it's time to revisit the Liquitex white ink. Adding this tone into the blue can be a bit tricky, as the pigmentation is very heavy in this ink, and it can quickly overwhelm the hue of the blue. With this in mind, and a careful touch, we'll lighten this blue up significantly, and apply the white enhanced highlights to just the very uppermost portions of the Calador sky. With the blue finished, and despite my cautioning against its use, the next color on the list is Citadel's White Scar. This layer style paint will be thinned down and used to reapply white details to the blue areas on the model, such as the stripe on her head and any sections where blue is spilled onto the jacket or the coveralls. It's most important to remove any blue stains from the jacket as we'll be applying the orange portions with translucent paint. And that translucent color is going to be Citadel's Griffhound Orange Contrast Paint. This paint will work to stain all of the white of the model's coat pooling in the crevices to help provide contrast. This contrast will further be enhanced by the blue shadows in the undercoat, adding a touch of cool color to this warm orange tone. After applying this in two thin layers, we'll start enhancing the contrast by adding a bit of lighter shade. In this case, it's Citadel's Fire Dragon Bright. Much as the method used in the previous blue coats, 
The highlight color will be added slowly to the original deep orange bit by bit and applied in thin layers to build up contrast between the dark shadows of the recesses and the light highlights of the raised portions. Of course, the placement of the highlights is concentrated on the upper facing areas of surface detail, anywhere that would logically catch the light informed by the earlier zenithal undercoat. For now, Watson's coat is looking a little bit too russet and not quite orange. And the goal here is to recreate the color of the original skin as accurately as I can manage. So for that, this method of layering color will continue until that point is reached. The tone I'm working with will continue getting lighter and lighter with the slow addition of more of the Fire Dragon Bright. Since her coat is fairly light colored, this highlight color will be applied much more heavily than the sparing use of highlights that we used on the blue portions of the model. The vibrant and loud warm orange tone will provide a lovely contrast to the deep desaturated blue, all while being kept in check by the cool color of the phthalo blue shadows in the undercoat. Of course, care will be used in the application of layers, avoiding getting too much paint onto the shoulder straps the patches and the ports on her arms. The detail on these bits is a bit soft, so getting too much paint onto these features can prevent their easy identification when it's time to color them up. All too often is the case that when you print out 3D models from video games, the individual details on their surfaces are very weak. Model sculptors take a lot of care in really exaggerating features on heroic scale sculpts. That way, when they're painted up, they can be recognized at an arm's length distance. That's definitely not the case when you're talking about a 3D model from a video game. These models are most often appreciated from the player's eye view in high resolution on a screen in a larger than life type of way. Since in-game shaders and lighting effects create the details in situ, there's no need to exaggerate these elements as miniature painting requires. When objects are set at a one-to-one -one scale, ambient lighting does all the work. We don't have that luxury when working at such a small scale and need to trick the eye into reading details as having perceptible details. Digressing, now that the core color of her coat is mostly fire dragon bright, we'll go ahead and start adding some Citadel Phalanx Yellow. Since we want to preserve the core orange tone, this particular set of layers will be added with a significant amount of water almost applied as a glaze. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, glazing is a technique in which the paint is applied in especially thin layers. These translucent layers show a bit of the previous color through them, so it can be used to tint an area or build up very smooth gradients. In our case, we're aiming for the former in an effort to emulate the play of warm light on the uppermost highlights. Now that we've finished up the two primary colors that need heavily layered highlights, it's time to start working on secondary tones. Next up on our painting playlist is to get out this Citadel Mechanica Standard Gray. This air style paint is fantastic as it's pre-thinned in the pot. Air colors are made to be sprayed through an airbrush hence the name, but the consistency is still real nice for application with a brush. So, with this semi-runny paint, it's time to base coat all of the dark gray portions. Looking at the character art, this dark gray is slated to be applied to the shoulder straps, the arm patches, knee pads, socks, fingers, and leg straps. These spots will have color applied with care using a sharp 3-0 brush taking care to not get any of the gray onto the previously applied colors. At this point, if any slips of the hand cause paint to stray from the intended spot, it's important to clean it up right away. For this, sometimes I keep an extra brush handy for emergency paint removal, just in case. But I find if I slow my breathing and take my time, applying tightly controlled paint isn't too bad. Anyhow, from here, it's time to add a bit of the Liquitex white ink into this Mechanica Standard Gray. I'm a big fan of lightening colors with this ink for twofold reasons. Firstly, it's super saturated and the pigment density ensures that a small amount goes a real long way. In addition, since this is an ink rather than an acrylic paint, 
It also serves to thin out the color that is being mixed. Next up is a minor accent color, which is a bit of red. Citadel's Mephiston red to be exact. At first I didn't realize that Watson had any red in her color scheme and in fact painted the accents on her shoes and the wires in the same color orange as earlier. Looking back at the character's art in high resolution, I caught that I had used the wrong color on these portions. There's not a lot of this tertiary accent color on her and it's easy to miss. But I'm glad that I caught my mistake and it wasn't any trouble at all to go back and paint over the portions that I've already colored in. In retrospect, it's kind of funny that I could miss this color, as the lightning bolt on her pylon is very obviously rendered in red. Just as is the case with the rest of the colors on this model, we're going to add a few layers of highlighting to the red. To lighten up the tone, I've elected to mix in a bit of this here Citadel Wild Rider Red. This color is a bit in the orange territory and serves really well to keep the red parts in line with the overall color scheme. If we were to instead lighten up the red with white, it'd start getting a bit too pink and change the feel of these accents entirely. Instead, this warm highlight is perfect and maintains the subtlety and the interplay of warm and cool tones. Given my choice of base on this model, I figure that this depiction of Watson is during a bright day on Storm Point, with warm yellow-white light shining down from the sun above and cool blue tones being reflected from the distant horizon on a cloud-free afternoon. Continuing onward, I've decided to incorporate a bit of true metallic color into the figure's palette. This folk art metallic silver sterling doesn't have the best coverage, but once built up into a solid coat, it's a fine color indeed. Though the art for Watson doesn't really have any truly shiny metallic bits, I figured that this would be a good choice to impart the suggestion of metal onto the parts that are rendered as mid-tone gray. My thinking was that making a distinction between the three gray tones on this model would be quite difficult at this scale, so I've elected to use a bit of artistic interpretation in my rendering of this Apex Champion. Now, to start making these silver bits get some depth, we're going to use some of Citadel's Null Oil Shade. This stuff is magic in a bottle and goes a real long way to imparting a nice richness to otherwise flat metallic colors. We'll apply it fairly heavily, but be extremely careful to not overdo it or get this stain and wash onto the previously painted colors. Moving onward with these metallics, we're going to start the highlight process with Folk Art's Metallic Pearl White. Just like every other layered highlight on this model, this color will slowly be mixed into the previous tone to build up lighter and lighter tones that will accent the raised details. I'd also like to take a moment and mention the value that these folk art paints provide. Craft paints aren't usually regarded as quality products due to their low pigment density, but when applied with care and the proper thinning, they work just fine in my experience. Furthermore, these paints have excellent dropper bottles and last for an extremely long time. I've been painting with these two particular tubes of paint since 2008 and they've shown no sign of drying out at all. At this point, I'd put off the secondary gray tone for long enough and it was time to get to it. Watson's fence nodes, the pylon, and the boosters for her jetpack are all a light gray tone, much lighter than the gray for her knee pads and shoulder straps. I needed to make a color that was distinctly different from the previous gray, as well as not being light enough to be considered white. So with this in mind, I've mixed up a starting color that's more or less a 50-50 mix of Mechanica Standard Gray and the Liquitex White Ink. Once this color was carefully applied to these sections demanding light gray, I slowly built up highlight colors by adding a little more of the white ink each time. This eventually left me with highlighted gray tones that were distinct from the darker gray details, but that still red as gray rather than white. It's sometimes hard to get a successful distinction between similar tones at this small scale, which is why I elected to utilize the metallic silver before. But this attempt was successful and left me with pleasing results. The tone that I ended up with looks pretty spot on to the character art, and it goes to show that you don't always need a huge selection of ready-made colors. Instead, 
You can indeed mix up tones that you need on the fly, especially when you're painting a one-off piece instead of a full skirmish force or an army. Well, I suppose I'm patting my own back a bit too strongly for what is simply a gray tone, but it does feel pretty nice when a mixed color provides the intended tone with accuracy. And speaking of mixed colors, it was at this point that I realized I didn't have a metallic copper color in my paint collection. Thinking quickly, I decided to get out this here Citadel Auric Armor Gold and mix it up with whatever translucent reddish hue that I could find. The color in question turned out to be my already utilized Griffhound Orange Contrast Paint. Adding this into the gold a tiny bit at a time, I was eventually left with a passable copper color and I applied it to the coils of Watson's pylon and the fence nodes. Finally, it was time to paint on the white of Watson's coveralls. Going back to that ubiquitous Liquitex white ink, I used this super thin translucent medium to build up the white tones that make up about a third of her overall palette. Since white can't be highlighted any brighter than, well, white, I instead started jabbing this color on in a stippling motion, first covering up any earlier mistakes then building up layers from the blue shadows up to a pure white highlight. The shoes, however, were heavily stained from first the orange, then the red, and required a heavy solid coat of white, which we'll go back and shade up later. Next on the agenda is the skin on her face, which will paint up with this here Vallejo Pale Flesh color. I picked up this tone in a WizKids Learn to Paint Skin Tones kit but I believe that this color is available through the Vallejo game color line. It's definitely way too pale as it is, but that'll get tamped down quite a bit once we go back and add some shading to this base layer. And speaking of shading, now I'll brush on some of this Vallejo flesh wash over all of the previously painted skin. This will immediately bring down the shock of the pale color as well as impart a bit of red warmth to her face. In hindsight, I should have gone with a more rosy skin tone, but this one worked good enough, and that's good enough for me. While that wash is drying, I'll go ahead and start working on Nessie, choosing to base coat her with this Apple Barrel Kelly Green. The coverage of this color is truly abysmal, so it ended up taking several thin coats to achieve the opacity that I needed. This is definitely one of those cases where craft paints show their weakness in painting models, but the hue was absolutely perfect, so I felt I had to use it. Besides, that thinness worked to my advantage while highlighting up this color using this here Citadel Phalanx Yellow. I wanted to achieve some translucent depth really quickly in the highlight layers, so I've added this color as well as some Citadel Contrast Medium in as I build up these lightning tones. After just a few layers of work, this little stuffy was imparted with a super warm yellowy highlight that still showed off that Kelly Green undercoat. I think out of all of the highlighting on the whole model, the Nessie as well as Watson's jacket really give a hint of that warm yellow afternoon sun. Though this play with warm and cool tones is a subtle effect, it really makes a huge impact on the viewer's subconscious perception of your work. And it's something that should almost always be considered in your color choices. Returning to the face of this model now that the flesh wash is dry, we'll reapply the pale flesh to the raised facial landmarks, such as the cheekbones, the chin, the nose, and the lips. I went ahead and did the fiddly fine details off camera, such as working in a bit of red brown on the lips and dotting the eyes. The last detail on her face that makes this model identifiably Watson is that Lichtenberg-esque scar on her cheek. To pick this out, I've selected this Vallejo flat red and mixed it with the original pale flesh color to get a pinkish tone and carefully picked out the detail with my 20 fine detail brush. With the face finished up, including all of the fine detail work, it's time to paint up Watson's bangs. I'll start out with a simple base coat of Citadel's Phalanx Yellow, ensuring that I get solid, bright coverage for the upcoming step. The yellow is a bit unnatural and looks, well, yellow and not blonde, but we'll fix that straight away. 
To shade the hair, we'll go ahead and use this here Citadel Nasdrag Yellow Contrast Paint and apply a heavy wash over the yellow. Once that dries completely, we can go back in with the Phalanx Yellow to highlight up some individual strands of hair. And thusly, we'll complete the blonde look with yellow highlights and some deep brown undertones. We're firmly in the home stretch now, and it's time to give a little love to Nessie. She needs her belly detailed, and to get the tone right, a nice off-white color is necessary. In my opinion, the absolute best color for this is going to be this here, Citadel Ushabti Bone. This color will be thinned down quite a bit and applied in several super thin coats to the underside of the stuffy, taking great care to avoid getting any of this paint on completed details and also maintaining a little bit of the blue shadows. Here at the end, we're going to use this here, Citadel Apothecary White to revisit Watson's shoes. The details on their surface were obscured earlier by a thick coat of white that was necessary to cover up some orange stains. So with a quick wash of this here contrast paint, we'll bring back some shadows in a nearly immediate fashion. And with that, this Watson model's paint job is complete. To begin detailing the base, I'll first apply some rich color with this quartet of Citadel Contrast colors, Warp Lightning, Nasdrag Yellow, Snakebite Leather, and Wildwood. Then while it dries, it's time to take a brief break. With break time over and the base dried, it's time to add the final embellishments. Firstly, we need to remove the model carefully from the temporary base with a hobby knife. This had me on edge really bad in fear of marring the paint job, but I relaxed quite a bit when I realized it was time to introduce today's guest palette, Pikachu. <laughs> I gotta admit, I'm having a blast with these guest palette reference moments, and it's a perfect use for this gigantic stack of stickers I have in my stash box. That said, it's really convenient to work from a little puddle of glue when applying base details, and I'm super glad that this silly country fried minisism has become a thing. Before gluing her down, I'll go ahead and remove a bit of the excess glue from the previous base attachment. It'll scrape off a bit of the red from the very bottom, but that's fine as the basing bits will obscure this lack of color. Now properly prepared, it's pertinent to take a little time to work out which angle is proper on this base. We want to present the model fully and not obscure any important details. Since there's a bit of fallen wood on this base, I figured that it's most complementary to the model to have that particular detail rearward facing. Once the model is in the correct orientation, I'll go ahead and secure her permanently to the base with a bit of super glue and a touch of accelerator. This use of accelerator is super important here because it will prevent any white marks from super glue crazing as the cyanoacrylate gel won't have a chance to vaporize. Rather, it gets cured near instantly. Committing to the effort, I'll use a toothpick to apply little globules of super glue with precision to the bottom of her feet. Since this particular glue is of gel consistency, It'll help hold the model in place while I unscrew the lid of my accelerator and likewise apply some drops of this curing agent with precision. After all, there's no sense in drenching the model with the pump sprayer when a very small amount will suffice. I've conditioned myself to use this application technique at a good friend's recommendation. And ever since then, I've likely cut my accelerator use in half or even more. You know who you are. Thanks a bunch. From here, I'm going to add a few carefully selected birch seeds to evoke fallen leaves. 
These scale-like seeds are amazing. They look so convincing and punch way above their weight in the basing enhancement department. I can't recommend enough a small cache of these seeds. You can pick them up in various places online. Next up, I'd like to add a bit of texture variation on this base, as well as help to obscure the damage to the paint on the edges of Watson's feet. To accomplish this, I'll use a touch of super glue and sprinkle on some of this fine basing grit by Gale Force 9. I've been using this hobby implement for years on various models, and I still to this day find satisfaction in adding these chunky little pebbles to my figure's bases. Continuing to spice up this base with a variety of textures and colors, I'm going to apply some little bits of Gale Force 9 clump foliage. This stuff is so useful in terrain building and base detailing, I've got to take a moment to recommend that you ensure there's a bit in your own collection. Clump foliage comes in nearly any color you can imagine and is available in multiple brands across a myriad of retailers' shops. Some more expensive than others, but if you do a little digging around, I'm sure you can find a fantastic deal on this product. Now, with all my waffling on about base detailing products out of the way, and all the bits and bobs put into their proper place, there's only one all-important step left in this miniature project. All that's left now is to black out the base rim, and this miniature rendition of my absolute favorite Apex Legends champion is complete. Thanks to all of y'all for watching up to this point, because now it's time for a grand reveal. And so, with that reveal, you can see that this model turned out pretty spectacular. Full transparency, she took about 8 hours to paint up, so it was a full day of grinding on this paint job. That said, this is more of a display piece, and from time to time I really think that that's necessary in painting your models up. Still, that's a whole lot of work to get a little model, it's a little less than 2 inches tall. But I think she looks pretty awesome, and it's a unique project that I think is gonna be well received by the community. So for that, I think this here in-depth tutorial was a proper submission for Country Fried Minis. I usually like to talk about some topic while I'm painting up the models, but today we're just focusing on the paint job and she's instantly recognizable. So I'm really pleased with the results. I wanna thank y'all once again for joining me here at Country Fried Minis. It's always good to see folks interested in the work that I'm doing, and it's even better when it's something that I'm really interested in painting. I'll get back to some Battletech stuff in the meantime, but this was a fun break from my usual fare. I'm really glad to have gotten to do it, and it's truly liberating to work on something that I want to paint. So whether you're working on some Battletech, or some Warhammer, or some Malifaux, or even an Apex model, I want y'all to remember to be happy while you're painting. Oh, and one last thing, I really love this here game Apex, and I'd be more than willing to play with any of y'all who drop a comment down below. I'll get in touch and send you my Discord invites. I'm even pretty good at the game too.
No. Down, you're about to get hurt. You gotta get it. They're judging my shields. 